So I'm also deeply honored by this invitation and uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizers and personally to Claudia Weber. Uh, and uh, also to thank uh, Jacqueline for this, uh, what sounded to me like a very nice necrologue, but, but hopefully. <laughs> so so uh, I'm thrilled to, uh, to know that uh, Balkan studies are actually thriving uh, at a moment when uh, there is this deep uh, area studies crisis in the US and in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, also I wanted to add that my heart was filled with admiration for these wonderful papers that I heard today. Uh, and so mine will be a very natural segue in, in what, I heard, uh, what I heard, hopefully not an anticlimax. So um, in my brief remarks, uh, I wish to make several points and I have structured them as follows. I will first address the discrepancy between the concepts Balkan and Southeastern Europe and how they, uh, their understanding inflects the respective Balkan and or Southeast European studies. While I agree that this might be a fruitless effort, I need to do it simply because the Fritz Exner Colloquium is about Southeastern Europe. Südosteuropa ist tot, aber ich sag lange lebe der Balkan. Uh, I then would like to say a few words about the institutionalization of teaching and research about our region, the balance between internal and external fa factors, and the dominant constellations that are the object of scholarly involvement and re uh, re reinterpretation. And thirdly, uh, I want to say something about the debates that have fueled our discipline. Now, given the time constraints, uh, I will abbreviate and summarize some points uh, or only mark them, but I'm open uh, for discussion in the Q&A. So first, the concepts. Balkan and South, uh, Southeast Europe are element, uh, elements of two very different cartographic uh, taxonomies, even as they aim to describe the same uh, region. Southeast Europe belongs to a classification which presumes Europe as a bounded territory with a center and respectively with regional positions in relation to the center. Northern, Eastern, Western, Southern, Northwestern, Northeastern, Southwestern, and Southeastern. But in this constellation, Southeastern is a marked category to borrow from linguistics, and as such, it is subordinate to the unmarked ones, even if some authors prefer it as a more neutral denomination. The Balkans, although clearly a European subcategory, does not carry this implicitly. And it is in the sp same family of uh, regional destinations like the Caucasus, Scandinavia, the Baltics, the Caribbean, Latin America instead of South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Polynesia, Melanesia, and so on, based on a prominent geographical characteristic or linguistic one. Mm -hmm. As such, it is or should be neutral, but it is not. The term Balkan has a number of manifestations that can be grouped in three categories. As it's simplest, of course, it is a name. Secondly, it is a metaphor, mostly but not exclusively negative. Thirdly, uh, the Balkans can be approached, and this is uh, where, where I thought uh, I made some contribution, as a scholarly category of analysis, the notion of historical legacy, which is intimately intertwined with the character of the Balkans as a concrete historical, not simply geographic region. While for a lack of time, I cannot develop here the theoretical argument, it, ha it has been uh, developed in writing, thinking in terms of historical legacies characterized by simultaneous overlapping and gradually waning effects allows to emphasize the complexity and plasticity of the historical process. In this case, any region is approached no longer as a static, territorial entity, but appears as a complex palimpsest of differently shaped entities, which not only exposes the porosity of internal frontiers, but also questions the absolute stability of external ones. And of course, uh, yesterday in the chat, there was this uh, question which was not answered about how we can go beyond the realm uh, and, and uh, embrace entities. And of course, the Balkans as a geographical notion is bounded, but it has participated in different entities. For example, during the communist period, it was in an entity together with China or Cuba, et cetera, et cetera. If you go back to archeology span or to antiquity, it doesn't make sense to speak about the Balkans because they were completely other entities. So uh, it, it is a, uh, a, a a valid point to be raised. So I have argued that in the narrow sense of the word, the Balkans are the Ottoman legacy. 
Uh, in practice, however, research of the region moves deeper in time, and in the broad sense of the word, the Balkans emerge as, again, this, bulk, this complex palimpsest of consecutive legacies, uh, which have territorially included it in different mega regions, some of them overlapping, some of them completely different. Most, most often, Southeast Europe and Balkan are employed as synonyms, even in the works of the same author. Uh, this is also reflected in the institutions that research and dispense knowledge about the Balkans, some of which are named Institution for Balkan Studies, others for uh, Southeastern Europe, but they all have the same research agendas. I myself am non-committal and use the concepts uh, interchangeably as synonyms, but I always prefer to speak about the Balkans because this is the concept that needs to be emancipated. So, Secondly, the institutional uh, institut uh, institutionalization and trends. Uh, how were the Balkans conceived as a region worth studying as a whole, and how was this institutionalized? And what is the balance between internal and external factors? Now, the worthiness of a region uh, is a tricky issue, and I can remind you of how Q. Trevor Oroper, the Regius Professor of Modern History of Oxford, referred to Sub-Saharan Africa as, and uh, I quote, the unrewarding gyrations of barbarous tribes in picturesque but irrelevant corners of the globe, end quote. We may be an irrelevant subregion of an increasingly irrelevant continent on the globe, but no one can deny us our picturesqueness. Balkan studies, broadly defined as a scholarly subfield analyzing Balkan societies as an entity in a historical perspective, began to be gradually shaped at the end of the 19th century. This came at a time when the young states, seceding from the Ottoman Empire, were creating an infrastructure of their national state institutions and were nationalizing their populations. In the humanities, research from the outside had been organized around Oriental studies, a discipline which, uh, with an already long pedigree uh, from the Renaissance on and later from the 18th century uh, Slavistics. The comparative thrust of Slavic studies prompted the practitioners in the Balkan countries to look beyond the national borders and promulgate first a common South Slavic space, and then to branch in to the non-Slavs, the Greeks, the Turks, the Albanians, and slowly arrive at Romanians, they slowly arrive at the notion of a common Balkan cultural space. And this has been very ably synthesized in a recent monograph by uh, Diana Mishkova. Thus, while developing in the shadow of Orientalistics and Slavistics, Balkanistics was a scholarly discipline generated from within. And this is, I, this is the thing that I want uh, to, uh, to stress. It is uh, generated from within and not necessarily by political motivations. It was uh, a, a scholarly uh, uh, initiative. Uh, while the Second World War undid much of this momentum, from the mid-1960s on, there was a powerful spur with the foundation of research institutes. As the Balkans were politically fragmented, these institutes served as a way to circumvent the political divisions and guarantee a fruitful scholarly exchange, even as they had to walk this delicate line uh, of adhering to national agendas. It is probably too early to generalize about the state of Balkan studies in the present era with the assault on area studies in most of the West and the limited resources. And this is the thing that I want to stress, the limited resources for research in Balkan countries themselves, the materiality, uh, coupled with the mobility of scholars. Nevertheless, valuable research is being produced, often neglected if it is written in the local languages. On the outside, I would say German balkanological scholarship continues to preserve its premier place. I want to pass now to the dominant trends that are the object of uh, lively scholarly involvement and reimpertination, very, very broadly. Uh, in the dynamic, well, may, maybe too dynamic uh, history of our region, the dominant question continue to be one, the question of empire, imperial legacies, the Ottoman Habsburg, the Romanov Soviet. The, the, secondly, the question of the nation state and nationalism itself being made and unmade. Uh, and to this can be added this massive entry of memory studies, mostly around the cluster of 
commemoration, as, as well as a trend which was closely linked to it, but that has shaped into a separate uh, powerful field, the history and memory of violence, violence and victimology as a cottage industry. Three, the question of ideologies and their practical systems, mostly notably fascism and communism. And four, the new trends, gender history, environment, uh, environmental history, and global history. So having identified these several thematic circles does not mean that they exhaust the field, but it seems to me they are the ones that at this moment attract most attention, at least from the literature that uh, I've been able to, to, to cover myself. I would not venture to predict how long this will last. The turnover seems to be rather high. For example, just a decade ago, one would have pointed to the study of alterity, the other, as uh, the research on the stereotypes as the cutting edge problematic, but this is no longer the case. And now uh, this turnover has uh, brought uh, other uh, foresight. And of course, under trends understood as big thematic clusters, I don't count the different methodologies that are used, the theoretical approaches that are mostly the objects of this colloquium. So let me now go into a little bit uh, in, in, in depth. First, the question of empire. This thematic circle is of course not novel per se, but up until a couple of decades ago, it was dealt with within the larger and teleological paradigm of the inevitability of the nation state system and the anomaly of empire in the 19th century. This linear approach, paralleling the wine from authority to democracy, uh, was broken from several angles. One was the general intellectual wariness with evolutionary thinking. Another was the bitter assessment of the performance of the much hailed nation state. A final one was the realization that empire is still present, even in unorthodox forms as informal empire, the United States, uh, China or Russia or uh, the benevolent empire of, uh, of the European uh, Union. Uh, there was thus an increased interest in the practice of empires often hailed as multi-ethnic uh, and multicultural entities whose experience could suggest alternative ways to the nation state. While the excesses of condemning empires have long been overcome, there is a trend present and it does continue a perceptible tendency to romanticize them. In some cases, this romanticizing served instrumentalist pur pur purposes, like for example, in the um, uh, 1980s and 1990s, the idea of an ongoing Habsburg legacy, uh, which was for, forged the concept of Central Europe, and it be became a political device for uh, early accession. Now, the idea of Central Europe has been forsaken now, yet the anachronistic reading of empire as a supranational, if not paradisical, uh, accommodation does persist. The most interesting work around this problematic appears around several clusters. One is the assessment of imperial legacies. Another is the new social history informed by the latest theories of class, agency, and spatiality. It comprises research on social structure, the formation of imperial elites, their networks, relations between center and periphery, the genesis and character of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, social banditism, communal life, historical democracy, and so on. Again, these are topics that are not entirely new. They have been present at least since the Second World War. There, some of them are being rediscovered, but are now creatively reframed with stressing categories in flux on how meaning is negotiated, uh, as well as the multiplicity of, uh, of meanings. Still within this cluster falls the reassessment of the economic viability of empires, as well as the emerging field of urban history in the region. And it, it is actually a very fruitful uh, line. Second, uh, the question of nation state and nationalism. So one would have uh, expected that the revived interest in empire would ring the death knell uh, on the dominant study of nations, but this has not happened. And the question of uh, whether national history is relevant has its strong detractors, but likewise also strong defenders. One thing is clear, the old fashioned nationalistic history is passé, although old fashioned political history is still dominant in terms of sheer output from the region itself, even as it is gradually losing its morally privileged position. This goes hand in hand with historians' increased awareness of the institutional origins of their profession and its complicity, not to say symbiosis with the state in constructing national politics. 
There is high quality work that follows in the footsteps of classical approaches to nationalism. The most inno innovative uh, work, however, concerns the revisiting of the formation of national identities with special attention to different social groups, mixed cosmopolitan constellations, porousness of boundaries, ambivalent identities, memory and commemoration. Much of it uh, uses new approaches, comparative and entangled history, historical anthropology, historical sociology, or cultural history that highlight the constant flux and complex dynamic of the nation as an essentially contingent factor. Another sub-theme that is at the forefront and that's, uh, that has shaped already as a cottage in, in the space, the one that I mentioned on violence, ethnic cleansing, migration, expulsion, trauma, and the ensuing litigation, healing, and so on. It is not confined to the Balkans, but very much triggered by developments there, especially, of course, the wars of Yugoslavia. When it is not strongly pres uh, prescriptive and moralizing, which, is, which, it, which it is most often uh, prescriptive and moralizing, it does make uh, genuine contributions to comparative history. Three, the question of ideologies and their practical systems. The authoritarian regimes of the interwar period, as well as the communist regimes after the Second World War, constituted a favorite topic for several generations of historians, as they were premised on, and also political scientists, premised on the implicit contrast to Western liberal democracy. This work still continues, but new themes and innovative approaches have appeared. The newest and arguably the most contentious, but also the most original thematic circle is the study of the communist legacy and the post-communist period. As a whole, this thematic circle was dominated until recently by the two totalitarianism paradigm, but this is being successfully complicated. Today, after a surge of pioneering anthropological research, there is a perceptible shift from the dominance of the totalitarian paradigm to one of modernization and others like paternalism, uh, elitism, or state capitalism. There is an ongoing debate about continuity versus rupture, including a reassessment of what is a revolution. New themes are being successfully developed, like consumerism under socialism, and as a whole, attention to daily life, the history of mentalities, and subjective experience. Much of this is infused by the huge interest in memory studies. And for the new trends. Uh, there, uh, so the, there is a fairly recent but fertile uh, thematic circle fo focused on women's and gender history, to which American scholars have made a unique, uh, if not exclusive, contribution, and there are programs in most Balkan countries producing interesting work. This is all the more admirable because, uh, particularly in the Balkan countries, they still function within uh, traditional and often patriarchal frameworks. Equally, environmental history is producing stimulating work, but is still seeking to establish itself. I just re recently um, uh, reviewed a book which is coming out at Pittsburgh with uh, Stefan Dorondel as, uh, as uh, editor. And uh, we have the new book on uh, Via Militaris uh, from uh, uh, Florian Riedler and Neda Stefanov. Uh, interestingly, uh, purely economic historians who have made significant contributions in the past and continue so in the adjacent field of Ottoman studies, uh, and I, I am wearing uh, my hat as an Ottoman historian, are not yet in vogue with very few exceptions in the, uh, in the Balkan field. Global history, world history, and transnational history have become an established fact and a growing tendency both within university curricula and in research and have not failed to influence Balkan studies. Most synthetic works of the region, be it in the form of um, you know, textbooks or surveys or encyclopedias or handbooks, uh, claim to be written in this vein, and some are of very high quality. But I don't think global studies is a panacea. A major claim of, glo of global studies is that it extends the circle of we. Yet stepping back from the, no from the nation and moving forward to the world is not a guarantee of political virtue. War, colonialism, racism have all been transnational projects. Communism was an international project and so was anti-communism, neither of which has an especially liberal pedigree. Just as writing national history has its complicities, there are complicities in writing world history. 
these remarks should not be seen as a dogmatic denunciation of the global studies approach. All they call is it for it to carefully and critically scrutinize it, to value it for the new opening it provides, but also evaluate it for the limitations it sets. Despite all the professions of bottom-up entanglement and emancipation, global history is premised on the notion of significance. And as Max Weber eloquently reminds us, importance is assigned in terms of causal significance, but assigning causality itself is a function of value orientation. The perception of meaningfulness uh, for us is the preposition of becoming an object of investigation, but only a part of concrete reality is interesting and significant to us because, because only it is related to the cultural values with which we approach them. So this all brings me to the debates. Um, I need to say that the division between trends and debates is artificial, of course. Um, debates function within trends, but it is worth highlighting them separately, even as these are unfortunately not very numerous. Debates in humanist academia are generally rare, which has to do with the nature of the academic profession, the internal hierarchies, career considerations, and so on. There are, of course, the notorious debates, you know, about US slavery uh, in the 90s, around nationalism, the famous Gellner Smith uh, uh, Warwick debate, uh, the backwardness debate, the Industrial Revolution, the Fisher debate, or the historical strike. Yet, uh, if you open the review, uh, review pages of any journal, the better reviews are informative, but extremely anodyne. In the field of Balkan studies, they are han a handful. Um, now I would divide the debates in open and implied ones. I have been asked to address particularly the so-called, and which I didn't know, the so-called Todorova debate. <laughs> um, I have to begin by saying that I ha I've had, uh, I always uh, have had uh, the utmost respect for the professionalism and the work of Professor Sundhausen. The debate was essentially about the realization of the political consequences of different theoretical approaches, which are never innocent per se, in a word about positionality. Briefly, it was a debate between structuralism and post-structuralism with some caveats. When I use structuralism, I mean less the linguistic structuralism of Saussure, uh, you know, Piaget or uh, the, uh, the Pratt School, formalized, of course, by uh, Lévi-Strauss in anthropology or uh, Lacan in psychoanalysis, but mostly the structural functionalism in sociology developed by Marx, Durkheim, and Weber, which profoundly affected history writing in the 19th and 20th century, in which I myself shared for a long time. Um, so the idea that human life is unintelligible except through interrelations within a system which constitutes a structure. Behind the surface phenomena, there are constant abstract laws and structures are the real things that lie beneath the surface of the appearance of meaning. The one problem is that structural laws are exceedingly binary and deal with coexistence and not with change. Distilling characteristics of a structure by paying no or little attention to temporal uh, transformations, some of which can be really radical, dooms it to stasis and stereotype. On the other hand, when I use, uh, when I say that I adhere to post-structuralism, for me, it embraces the strong sides of structuralism, but adds not only the study and interpretation of an object or an event, but also the systems of knowledge and power that produce them. So let me give now a, a theoretical, not to be too abstract, I'm a historian in the end, and I share with Hare, the, the love for concreteness. Now, let me give you a, a theoretical and then a drastic example. The first, uh, the first example is the, the fundamental difference between what I have developed as historical legacies and the 
notion of path dependence in political science, because po political sciences are telling me, well, aren't you talking about path dependence? No, I'm not. Path dependence was developed within a shift in political science toward a greater appreciation of history or the temporal dimensions of phenomena, a move away from purely structural, functionalist, and heavily quantifying approaching, approaches. It involved uh, a focus on chain of events or processes stemming from an initial critical juncture. It emphasizes the potential, the potentially self-enforcing uh, effects of early outcomes and has enriched the understanding of social and political outcomes by paying greater attention to long-term processes. Welcome as this is, to me, path dependence is a strictly internal disciplinary and development within political science. And I want to insist on the basic distinction of this concept from my historical legacy. The coining of path dependence came about in order to better understand the chances for future institution building, for modeling, and for political choices. On the one hand, it was supposed to warn against voluntarism of the sort that any well-implemented rational choice decision by outstanding elites would bring about the desired results. After all, as the formula would have it, history matters or culture matters. On the, on the other hand, by not having enough patience with the historical record, but hastily, very often pro forma, uh, electively bringing about a path, sometimes even called legacy, with definite characteristica, it produced a determinism, a, teleolo a teleology, often on the brink of fatalism. My notion of historical legacy comes from a very different perspective and is propelled by a very different motive. It does not set itself the primary task to understand in a retrospective gaze how and why things have causally brought present arrangements or how, how they can shape future ones. On the contrary, it demonstrates the complexity of the historical record, the contingency, uh, by arguing that it cannot serve as a straitjacket. Of course, I would not go so far as saying that history does not matter at all, but I think that path or the legacy are so windy, flexible, changeable, permeable, that they cannot be isolated as a bacillus. This is not uh, hard science. In a word, legacies are not a thing, they are a process. Moreover, at least in my, to my gaze, they point to many more commonalities than distinctions. Finally, uh, I think that my historical legacy is much more empowering. It allows us to be free from the shackles of a deterministic historical process. They are also to the ones who want strict recipes from history, disquietingly indeterminate. So I will never forget how uh, I gave uh, a lecture many years, 15 years ago uh, in, in, in Germany in front of legal uh, historians. Uh, and uh, the reaction was, you know, in general positive, but it culminated in a question. This is highly sophisticated and compelling, but it does not so seem to be applicable. But that's precisely the point. It should not be applicable. So my drastic, even vulgar ex example, and I apologize for it, but I think we should show what, what happens, um, comes from an oral debate that I had uh, some years ago in an institute in Vienna. Two prominent academics had written a piece titled Töten mit Messer, apropos the violence in Yugoslavia in the 1990s, making the point that there is a tradition of masculinity in a typical continuity in this type of violence. I was asked why I, I objected. I had just arrived, I said, from the Judenplatz with the Lessing Monument, and on a building there was a brass plaque in Latin celebrating the cleansing of the city in 1421 from the Lupi Judaici when, uh, when in a pogrom the Jews were burned. So I said, maybe we could speak of a five centuries old tradition of Toten with foyer. I realized this is not an elegant uh, uh, academic debate, but it did make a point rather than uh, bringing up uh, abstract notions of uh, post-coloniality and so on. So what is interesting in the so-called tea debate, and allow me here also some reminiscences since we are all in this vein in the, here um, uh, on positionality, uh, was my role as a naive outsider. 
when the Balkans from discovery to invention, uh, the predecessor of imagining the Balkans was published in Slavic Review in, in 1994. Uh, I was later told that instead of the usual two blind reviews that one always gets, I was vetted by five. Because I dared question the sacred cow of American diplomacy, George Kennan. But it was published and the reaction was positive. Uh, when in 2000, in, a somewhat, in the somewhat more hierarchical German uh, academic environment, I was invited to submit uh, an article for Geschichte, Geschichte und Gesellschaft. Uh, there apparently, uh, I was told after that, was a discussion uh, among the editorial board of not publishing it because it, con it was considered to be attacking a prominent colleague. Uh, and it finally did come out in 2002 in a volume on mental maps, but not as an article but in the discussions forum, and it was answered by two other people, but not by, uh, by Professor Zundhausen. So there was never a dialogue. There was never, in fact, a debate. Uh, so um, another open published debate uh, in which I have participated concerned historical demography, uh, especially the idea when I was very much enamored of quantitative history and was doing this empirical research, uh, that uh, in, in the idea that the communal family, the Zadruga, was typical for all South Slavs with all the ensuing generalizations about lack of individuality, collectivism, and so on and so forth. In this case, I think uh, it was the temptation to overgeneralize and create models without having done the minute and rigorous work that is required for other regions before reaching broad conclusions. But it is somehow allowed for, for the Balkan uh, region. Um, oh, speaking about positionality, I can also share another thing. So uh, after I published Imagining the Balkans, I was invited to Paris um, uh, in a uh, high um, how high powered conference. And after I finished, the director of the Institute asked me, so uh, could you have written this work in Bulgaria? And what did American academia give you? Uh, and uh, I answered, I was not polite. I said, yes, I could have written it in Bulgaria. Nobody would have read it. And what the American academia gave me was an invitation to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> So a debate which should have taken place uh, in the, for the Balkan region, uh, but has not, uh, although it is implicit and conducted sotto voce, is around the category of national indifference. Uh, it was first proposed by Peter Judson, but then theorized very broadly by Tara Zara. It became extremely modish in the United States, but has been applied exclusively to Central Europe, Poland, Bohemia, less so for the Baltics and to Dalmatia. And now it, it, it's trying to be applied to the Balkans. There have been a few critical responses, but again, no real discussion. And Zara never engaged in these discussions. One is again, uh, you know, beginning to wonder whether this has to do with academic power dynamics. So uh, allow me again, an example, uh, to illustrate the uneven application of all these notions from a recent important work, uh, the Handbuch Balkan, uh, which was published in uh, 2014, uh, speaking about national movements in the early 19th century. And I want to involve now a different uh, area, since here most of the examples come from the Yugoslav area, I would like to mention Greece, because uh, in uh, its 200 years uh, uh, that we are celebrating now the, the bicentennial of the Greek Revolution. So let me give you the quote. The quote is the following. The historiography in the Balkan countries interprets the uprising, Erhebung, nicht Revolution, Erhebung, in Serbia, 1804-15, in the Peloponnesus and the Greek mainland, 1821-28, usually as an expression of the national strife for liberation of the Christian population against Ottoman domination. In contrast, the research outside the region as a whole assumes that the mass of the peasant rebels had backward looking goals, the restoration of the old order, and did not know what to do with abstract concepts like nation and nation state. Even the elites were split in two wings, a conservative one and a nation ideological one, 
influenced by foreign models from Western Europe, end quote. Incidentally, this was written by Holmsenhausen. <laughs> uh, so here we have it all. There is a high historiographical binary in which the emic inter internal view is one that serves the national cause and the etic outside one presumably objective with, with no vested interests looks at the complexity of the phenomena, emphasizes the lack of national consciousness among the peasantry, which comprised 80 to 90% of the population. It does allow for ideological clarity among part of the elite, but this clarity is of course mimetic, not organic. The overall conclusion actually is correct. Uh, it gives much more uh, significant weight to the play of international relations and the Eastern question. My objection is not the general conclusion, but how it is reached. So let me begin with ideology. No one is denying the immense role of French revolutionary ideas on Rigas, Corais, uh, the Filikia Teria, and so on, but there is a slight but telling shift in which French tends to be substituted to Western. So all of a sudden it's Western ideas. Ypsilantis and the Filikia Teria were strongly influenced by West European ideas, it says, as if French ideas had not awoken and radicalized also the rest of Western Europe, including and especially Germany. There is also little question that the mass of the population, there is no question, had heard little of the concept of nation, as if by contrast, everyone in the 1770s in the American colonies was reciting Thomas Paine or French peasant in the same period, Beaumarchais. I bet that more people in the Balkans were singing Rigas's, uh, you know, war hymn, the Turius. Having heard much of the civilized laments of Voltaire and the Marquis de Custine over the barbarous East, which means Russia, it would be instructive to hear a civilized Russian, the historian Nikolai Karamzin, muse about the French Revolution, which he witnessed. And this is what he had to say. Just do not think that the whole nation participated in the tragedy that plays itself today in France. Hardly one in a hundred acts. The rest are looking, judging, discussing, crying or laughing, clap hands or whistle like in a theater." End quote. So peasants into Frenchmen has become the obligatory model for national assessments. What is interesting to me is how it is applied differently even for the Balkans. In the outside literature of, on Greece, for example, while there is the usual deprecating, but in many cases justified stance that the people were indifferent to abstract notions like nation, still their Greekness has never been called into question. Unlike the persistent idea of Slavs or South Slavs, who allegedly only gradually learned to become Serbs, Bulgarians, Croats, Macedonians, and so on. So methodological nationalism is avoided only differentially. Uh, another issue that I would have liked to dwell on, but uh, given the constraints of time I can address in the Q&A, uh, is the application of post-colonialism, uh, of which I am also ambivalent, not entirely negative, but also ambivalent. Um, so in conclusion, uh, from what I have seen, uh, is coming out of a very, very talented cohort of young uh, volcanologists is their acute consciousness of the workings of positionality. And, and this is great. Where I think that Balkan studies would be more effective is in engaging with broader comparisons outside the region. Uh, this, this should not necessarily follow the mantra of PhD requirements where to equally compare two systems uh, or two countries usually within the same region and rarely neighboring ones. But for example, what Igor is doing is, is, is great, you know, the comparison to Chile. It can be a national study, but comparing it only at times structurally with other, even remote examples, which will further de-exoticize de uh, uh, our field. So uh, I want to thank you all and uh, for making me happy uh, that the field is in very good hands. Thank you. So thank you very much, Maria, for this intriguing talk and also very welcome, a warm welcome from my side. My name is Lisa Satyuko from the University of Leipzig. And I must say that I'm 
a bit disappointed now because as a student I of history of South Ethiopian history, I attended a course by Claudia Weber. It was an introduction to the history of South Ethiopian Europe, and we learned about the Todorova Sundhausen debate. <laughs> and we were all imagining students, Maria Todorova and Holm Sundhausen sitting, meeting at conferences like this and debating all night long. And now I learned that this didn't take place. <laughs> so <laughs> but let me now uh, introduce to you. Uh, our commenter, uh, Sabine Ruta, who is, um, who is familiar to most of you, I guess she is based at the Institute for East and Southeast European Studies, and she is an editor for the, um, for the journal Comparative Southeast European Studies. She works on labor history, port cities, memory culture, and last but not least, also on the conception of Balkan and Balkanism. And so she edited a volume on the uh, name Beyond the Balkans, towards an inclusive history of Southeast European, and we are very, very happy to welcome you here for the comment. Yes, um, hello everybody online, uh, 47 people listening uh, beyond us here in the room, I'm very glad to hear this. Um, I would like to thank you for the invitation, I feel very honored. Uh, uh, for the task that has been given to me, and uh, you just heard the talk, it's not an easy task. Um, um, yeah, I would like to share a few thoughts and several points that uh, Maria raised, uh, but first of all, I think I would like to make a, another comment. Uh, I'm increasingly sorry, I must say, that Holm Sundhausen cannot be with us. I mean, <laughs> he, he's received so much input and not all of it positive. Um, I would really like to hear what he would have to say about this. Um, yeah, but I will share with a few thoughts on several points, um, fewer than I'd like to because uh, I'd rather be brief uh, and um, go into discussion with all of you. And um, listening to the comments uh, yesterday and today, I also realized that my comment is coming out of my own discipline, which is history and it's not anthropology and not political science or anything else. Um, so, um, I very much like how you turn the efforts of Southeast Europeanists to de-Balkanize their field against them. Um, you're right, of course, the Balkans as a European subcategory is like Scandinavia, the Baltic, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on, but then it's not. Um, colonial studies and post-colonial studies have shifted Eurocentric epistemolog epistemologies uh, towards global ones, which predominantly means precisely putting Latin America, Africa, and also India on the radar. Um, I wonder, when was the moment when historians of Southeast, uh, Southeastern Europe could have jumped on that train and contribute their methodologically innovative share to deconstructing the West? Why do we still, as you said, need to emancipate, to de-exoticize the Balkans. Wolfgang Höpken yesterday expressed himself in terms that I found much more optimistic than I would have imagined. He said that today, Southeast Europeanists, and I guess he was talking about historians uh, as well mostly, and the representatives of um, the so-called general history on the other side, easily mingle, talk to each other, and work on even levels methodologically. And I must say that my own experience has taught me otherwise. And I would be interested in hearing um, your, Maria's, Maria, uh, your take on this. Are we normal yet, as he suggested yesterday, or are we indeed exotic? Uh, in 2004, so almost 20 years ago, for the field of East European history, uh, Carsten Görke and Heiko Haumann uh, made a point that remains valid still today. Studying East and Southeast European history in the framework of a separate subdiscipline will only become superfluous when historians have achieved a really equal standing among themselves. It is still true, however, that while studies in modern Southeast European history can hardly do without reference to France, Great Britain, Germany, even Italy, the opposite is hardly true. Western European societies are usually studied without taking account of, say, Poland, Serbia, Bulgaria, or Greece. Persistent as, and we've just heard a wonderful example of a Russian observer of the French Revolution, um, persistent as the state of things may be, it lacks historical legitimacy. 
borders, especially ideological ones, such as nation state borders and the borders defined by the Cold War, have an epistemological weight and afterlife. In fact, Cold War binaries have continued to substantially shape post-Cold War historiography in Europe. And it's easy to define how historiography should renovate these nationalist or Cold War binary epistemes. It should be deconstructivist, decentralizing, uh, plurilingual, focus on processes, entanglements, shared history, historical overlappings, ambiguities, fluidities, even paradoxes. Many epistemic conflicts over who possesses sovereignty over historical interpretation could thus become accessible and meaningful. Contacts, interactions, movements, exchange and transfer. And I'm, I think I'm summarizing here what Maria said about structure, stru structures making history, structures and interaction within structures uh, make reality or construct reality. Um, but they have most frequently taken place in an asymmetric manner and often enough violently within the Balkans and in contact with the wider world. In the Balkans, writing history in a nation state framework has seen an upsurge since 1990 that easily matches its counterparts and that is area studies as well as global and transnational history. And this upsurge has effectively kept hidden the commonalities contained in the exclusivist national master narratives. In fact, the parallel histories of nationalism and national, nationalization are at stake here. Entangling uh, the results of each historiographic tradition shows just how much the Balkan societies have been immersed in parallel histories. And if these were put into a complex perspective, history would not become less conflictual, but it would become less exclusivist, less essentialist, um, and considerably more interesting. And this has been amply proven, I think, for example, by the four volume Entangled Histories of the Balkans published with Brill a few years ago. It seems to be indicative of the state of affairs, however, that these volumes, the result of a large European Research Council project, uh, have had little impact domestically, while internationally, at least among Southeast Europeanists, they have been acknowledged as the way to go forward by many. If history writing followed more thoroughly the paths these volumes have indicated, this could maybe be the way to demonstrate once and for all why and how the Balkans deserve to be treated as an intriguing location in global history. So why haven't we ever, over the last 30 years or so, really succeeded to convince anybody of the worthiness of our region, as you put it? Much of it may have to do with the scarce allocation and availability of resources, to be sure. But was this inevitable? And have now all chances been forfeited with Europe as a whole on the global retreat? Going global, as you say, of course, no guarantee of avoiding methodological traps. It seems to me that it would be worthwhile if we discussed uh, further the three issues that you raised, or three of the many issues that you raised. One is, what has become of nationalism studies? Second, have imperial studies changed for the better? And third, what does global slash transnational history actually mean? And I think that was um, that what has been forfeited in important ways over the last 20 years or so or 30 um, is the chance to foster a sustainable and entangled debate or conversation on what the 20th century meant for all of Europe and how it should be read to provide for democratic stability in the future. The events of 11 September, 9-11, yeah, 11 September 2001, had additionally detrimental repercussions for this missed dialogue. It radically changed the global geopolitical political scene once again, sending the transitional 1990s into untimely oblivion. The decade of Eastern Europe's transition, post-socialist transition, and of the 1991-1999 Yugoslav wars now seems like a gap decade between two epochs. Before, there had been something that is the Cold War uh, world order, and afterwards there has been also something, the global war on terror and one crisis after the other. 
The systemic changes prompted by the fall of the Berlin Wall, as well as the 100,000 dead in the Bosnian War, the longest siege of a city in the 20th century, Sarajevo, genocide returning to Europe, Srebrenica, and hundreds of thousands of European refugees within Europe have fallen out of sight. The ongoing crisis of the most recent decade, bearing the names of its most visible, visible critical events from financial crisis to Euro to Greek crisis to refugee crisis, Ukraine, Catalan crisis, Brexit, Trump, and now comprehensively coronavirus, and of course the climate crisis, uh, seems to have, cynically speaking, normalized the Balkans, as several of its fragmentizing symptoms suddenly plague Europe as a whole, and indeed the world as such. Um, to conclude on a positive note, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on the effects of a truly global Southeast European intellectual diaspora, present in this room, by the way, prompted by reasons that go well beyond the Yugoslav wars. Having gone truly global, these scholars may effectively have contributed and continue to contribute to the dissolution of leftover Cold War mental mappings. Um, now, I've been gathering social scientists and historians from Southeastern Europe in my journal for many years. And regardless of where they might work and teach, both in Southeastern Europe and elsewhere, I have witnessed their competence, originality, commitment, and transnational perspectives. And I strongly subscribe to the idea that this global or globalized generation of knowledgeable scholars is the driving force behind much that has been genuinely, <clears throat> genuinely innovative and conceptually convincing, built on the rubble of the overly unreflective, excessively hasty, and often inadequate post-1990 attempts to rearrange geopolitics and research designs along with them. Thank you.